Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedicase. I've got a couple degrees in theology, and I'm working on another in philosophy of religion. And throughout my time and my studies, I've had some really awesome conversations with amazing people. But unfortunately, those conversations are lost to the sands of time. So the goal of this podcast, then, is to have fascinating conversations with experts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life, to record those conversations and to share them with you. So you get to learn as I learn. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode, we're going to be talking with Dr. Barry Lamb about David Lewis's concretism about um, possible worlds. So the the possible worlds are real things just like ours. Um, I won't get too much into it because uh, that's why we have Barry here. But uh, before we jump in, I just want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the podcast. As I've said before, I would love to make this a full-time thing. So um, I need support from viewers like you. Uh, If this is your favorite podcast or if you've benefited from this podcast, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find the link in the description wherever you're getting this podcast at. Another way to support the podcast is to uh, like and share, to comment. And uh, another really cool thing is a lot of people, a lot of my guests will come back and and see your comments. So be cool because they could be seeing them. But uh, a lot of times uh, by leaving a comment is uh, a great way to get in touch with some of the guests. You can also find us in Parker's Pensies Pensiers. I don't know how to pronounce that right, but uh, it's a Facebook group for listeners of the podcast and guests uh, alike. So a lot of the guests are in there and we're having fantastic conversations all day, every day in there. Um, so find us on Facebook. Thank you for all the support. Seriously appreciate you guys. Without further ado, let's pull Dr. Barry Lamb in. Barry, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. Very happy to be here. Yeah, so so you are a uh, an associate professor of philosophy at Vassar College, and you did your PhD at Princeton. Is that right? That's correct. I got my PhD at Princeton. I was there from two thousand one to two thousand seven. So mm-hmm. I overlapped with David Lewis for exactly one month. Oh, nice, nice. Um, were you able to to talk with Lewis at all there? No, no. In fact, the story that I relay and the we, we should let people know why we're talking about who David Lewis is, right? Yeah. David yeah. Lewis is one of the great 20th century philosophers, uh, American philosophers. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he died in 2001, uh, just shortly after 9-11. And uh, I, this year, and the 20th anniversary of his death and his 80th birthday, I decided to make a miniseries about his life and his works. Mm-hmm. And he was... Uh, at Princeton for exactly a month while I was there. And, mm-hmm. uh, and the very first story I relay is the story of how he died. Yeah. Um, well, I, I should, uh, I should mention again. So everyone go check out the, the mini series. It's uh, four episodes called, uh, the man of many worlds. And I, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you've seen it cause I've shared it a bunch. I really, really enjoyed it. It's a narrative philosophy, uh, mini series. Um, but Barry, yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about uh, how he died? Yeah, so the there was it was it basically he died after one night of not getting food on time at a yeah. restaurant in in Princeton. David Lewis was a lifelong diabetic. He had a late diagnosis, um, so he had probably spent many of his youthful years um, with unhealthy because he wasn't uh, he wasn't di- right diagnosed early enough. He tried to manage it in his adult life and. Um, by the end, by the last year of his life, he, um, which I go through on the last episode mm-hmm. of the series, he needed a kidney transplant, which his wife provided for him. And it, things looked on the up and up, but there was one night in Princeton where um, things didn't go very well. And his, um, his wife found him dead in bed that following Sunday. And that kind of cut his life short. So I think like age 60 counts as short yeah. by today's standards. It did. Yeah back then. But, you know, by philosophy standards, it was a really, a life cut really short because as we know, he probably had 10 papers in the works. Yeah. And, um, and or just in his head, right? Cause yeah. the, the guy was, it's fair to say he's a genius, right? Like the, by the way, the way you were describing, he just had papers fully in his head that he could just dictate. That's right. Many of them at, the, yeah. at once, he was yeah. probably working on eight, eight, between eight and 12 papers at a time. Yeah. And if you asked him what it was, the, the being the weird guy that he was, yeah. right? He would say, "Let me try something," and then just start talking. Yeah. And then an hour later, it was the whole paper. Yeah, yeah, that just was amazing. Him. 
Yeah. Yeah. That that last episode, man, that was it was super sad. Like thinking about that his life cut short in that way and from such a just not getting his dinner on time. You know, it's just like <laughs> that's a, all, a, that's what it was crazy, right? Seriously crazy thing. Yeah. If if his theory of uh of concretism about possible worlds is true, then maybe there's some some David Lewis's out there who got their dinner on time, who are still out there dictating papers. Oh, they're definitely out there if he's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um well, Barry, real quick, I just wanted to get a little bit on you before we jump into uh, more on Lewis and concretism. What did you do your, your PhD on uh, there at Princeton? I was an ep epistemology student and epistemology scholar in my early career. So my dissertation was on um, what rationality is, uh, epistemic rationality, the kind of rationality that concerns making up your mind in reasonable ways. Yeah. That so I got my first job on the basis of work like that, and I got tenure, more or less, on the basis of work like that. And that my story is that that was you know I got my first job at the age of twenty six. Wow. So by so by the time I was thirty two, <laughs> thirty three, I you know I I had decided that I wanted to change, and so mm. that's what led to podcast production. Yeah. Um, and so the the podcast is Hi-Fi Nation. And uh, I first got introduced to you through this series because it's amazing. Um, are, are all the, can you tell us a little bit about Hi-Fi Nation? Is it is it uh, a lot of mini series or is there an overarching theme that you're continuing? Hi-Fi Nation has both mini series and one-off episodes. So mm -hmm. the show is a documentary type show. So, you know, I, I like to think of it. If, so a few people who watch television you know they there are these many there are shows like on pbs like frontline or something you know yeah. and it'd be like different things and it could be like on nature and it could i've always wanted to do that i always thought that there's so much that philosophy touches on the yeah. original mission vision for the show was that it would highlight the way philosophy uh uh intersects with everything so like the very first season it was um the wars in iraq and afghanistan whether must Christians and Muslims worship the same God? Mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 concept of a mashup in music, like, and yeah. every season, most seasons have been like that. More recently, I've become interested in doing miniseries because uh, even I want to take deeper dives into things than just one-off yeah. episodes. So the entire fourth season has been a deep dive on philosophy and criminal justice. Mm -hmm. So the, I I made eight episodes looking at philosophical issues in the criminal justice system from the beginning to the end. So the beginning is when uh, and how you criminalize something. Yeah. And the end is like after sentencing and people are out of prison, what happens to them, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. it was, and, and so each episode is about one stage of the criminal justice system from legislation to policing, prosecution, sentencing and stuff. And then a philosophical issue on each one of those. And then this season is a bit of a hybrid. Hmm. So over 10 episodes, I'm going to have a mini series on David Lewis, which is already all out. Yeah. And then I've done episodes on the ethics of, of biotech, biotech um, and cloning and things like that. I have an episode on kidney donation, um, but I'm going to end it with another little brief mini series and it's going to be philosophy and vampires zombies yes. right? like monsters right so yeah. like so so this season's a bit of a hybrid there's like one-offs and then there are also little mini series uh it's so awesome yeah i i um i love what you're doing i love the the broader view of because i think that that is you know philosophy is like the secret back door to everything else you study philosophy and you gotta you have some tools to study everything else and so yeah i say my podcast about philosophy theology nature and life and I've kind of accidentally got into just like philosophy of religion type stuff, but I still mm -hmm. go for like the the broader the broader view. A lot of that's just because of who I know as well. But um, yeah, I, I love it. So you got another uh, another fanboy here because uh, because of the Lewis episode, I've been looking at your other stuff and really uh, appreciating that. I wonder um, just just again to touch on it because I can't the rationality stuff. Were you? getting into like Robert Audi type stuff back then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Definitely. What did you, did you take a position as like, this is what uh rationality is. Did you have like a linguistic, you know, Donald Davidson type style or what? No, what my, yeah. the view that I defended in the dissertation is that 
we should think about rationality and what rationality consists in um, as, um, I mean, I'll use some vocabulary here, as, a, yeah. as something that happens over time or that is diachronic rather yeah. than something that happens at one time. So I, I defended this view um, that said that you should never ask about whether somebody's belief is rational. Mm. You should never ask about whether they have a set of beliefs that fit together, whether they're rational. Like that's not the right way to think about what rationality consists in. Rationality mm. is about how people change or maintain their beliefs over time. Interesting. Right. So if so, you have to look at that and to see whether they're rational there. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, and to the so, I mean, I guess um, another one way of one analogy that I used to talk about is um, you shouldn't think about um, say justice. Right. <laughs> um, you can think about it as a um, are the outcomes just or like mechanisms or the the ways things are done procedurally. Are they are they just right? And yeah. the way people think about justice is, oh, there's a little bit of both, right? Some people think that sometimes outcomes are just, and but but the process the process is just, but the outcome isn't. Or yeah. some people think that, um, and whatever you think about the debate there, there you kind of understand, right? So there are these libertarian arguments that say if you have these just procedures and transactions between people, then it's not about the outcome. If the outcome is grossly uneven, that's not an injustice because right, it's about justice, the procedure. It's yeah. the procedure. Yeah. And, th and that's how I thought about rationality. Now, I don't want to take a position about libertarianism or anything about the justice. <laughs> sure. but, but the position I took, you know, way back when was that rationality shouldn't be thought of that way. Yeah. Rationality should not be thought of as the outcome, right? Um, yeah. it, it should be thought of more procedurally over time. Think, if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. And it's connecting to a lot of what I've been thinking about in like free will literature with a historicist condition. Uh, so I think that's great, man. That's really a really interesting view. Um, I wonder, so I wonder if that does kind of dovetail into uh, the block universe and, and Lewis's, um, you Maybe, know, four dimensionalism yeah. Yeah. Uh, that we are this kind of like space time, uh, People always say space time worm, and it only can be said like pejoratively, I think. And, and yeah, that's it, right. Yeah. Like, what else? What else would you call? Uh, let, let's talk about Lewis's view of, of time really quick. Um, yeah. Can you can you help us? Yeah, absolutely. So let's not talk about worms at all, right? There are so many things in that we interact with on a daily, in in daily life that are four dimensional objects and not three dimensional objects. Mm -hmm. We just don't talk about it that way. So you know, here's one example. A baseball game is a four-dimensional object, right? It's how many innings? It takes place yeah. across. An, an inning is like like one unit, but yeah. a nine-inning game is like something that we don't say, oh, a baseball game is a space-time worm. No, <laughs> it's like a base time, right? Any yeah. sports, any sports entity is a thing that happens across time, right? We talk about tennis matches, soccer matches, boxing matches, baseball games. These are things that happen over time, right? Yeah. The yeah. game just is the nine innings or even extra innings yeah. that happen, right? And yeah. any particular moment in a baseball game is just a moment, right? So like one moment could be, you know, here's the count, three and two, two outs, bottom of the seventh, yeah. you know, person on, you know, guy on second and third, right? Like th that's a moment, mm -hmm. right, of a baseball game. But the game itself is this thing over time. And that's what David Lewis um, presented as what a human being was, sorry, a person, what yeah. a person was. A person is, a, a essentially four-dimensional creature, right? Yeah. And we think about that for some aspects of people, right? So we think of um, careers. Careers are four-dimensional things, yeah. right? We don't think like oh, you have stages of your career, but the whole career is something that's extended over time. Yeah. And David Lewis just said, just just um, made the case that that's how you should think about a person. A person is the totality over time. Right. And every yeah. given moment, like when I'm talking to you and you're talking to me, me and you are particular moments of a person. Mm -hmm. Is that it's a segment? Did, did he say segment? I can't remember yeah, the terminology the, he used. The, Lewis wasn't as careful as later people were, but there's, okay. you know, people talk about stages of a person. Stages, or that's right. Segment of a person. Segment is like, it could be wider, right? It could be like your 17 year old segment. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, stages. And, um, and, 
the idea is to think about a person in that way rather than as somebody who's completely in front of you at a right at a moment. Yeah. So if I'm talking to you right now, the traditional way of thinking is that there's two people here, right? And um, if you take the baseball game analogy very, very seriously, you you would just say, well, there's two different moments of the baseball game. Yeah. Really, the whole game is the thing that happens over, across nine innings. Yeah. And for you, your entire person is the whole thing that happens across the whole lifetime. And yeah. so am I. Yeah, I really like that. Um, I that's a that's a great way. The sports stuff is gold. That's a really good way of thinking of it because usually I'm talking with atheists who are saying this is crazy because you'd be a space time yeah. worm. Um, yeah. And so I wonder if it if an atheist can still have that kind of uh, totality view in saying, well, yeah, you are the the sum of all of your stages or or segments or whatever, but those aren't actual only the real moment is actual whereas the the b theorist or block universe would say well you need the full thing you need all segments of you to be actual in order to have you Did, what do you make of that yeah you know one of the things like so david lewis being the systematic thinker that he was mm -hmm. he was one of these people that thought everything has to go together right yeah. if i think of persons this way then i have to think of time as as fully existing, you know, yeah. in four dimensions too. So the entire block, and I can't think of it as um, the present existing only in the past and future not, or the past and the present existing, but the future not. Like I, you know, it's possible you could try to develop logically views in which you put all these things different things together yeah. and that's what being a clever philosopher is right you just try yeah. to like you know or theologian right you know right like you know um what has been christian theology but the attempt at trying to metaphysically put it things together that's right like the trinity and and, and yeah. resurrection and things like that that's right and so and so um and so lewis always went for the things that most naturally go together and work 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 them out as naturally going together. Yeah. Um, and so so he would say, yes, if you thought of persons this way, it's because you think of time this way, or you have to think of time this way. Yeah. If you think of time this way, you have to think of time travel in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And if you have to think of time and time travel in a certain way, then you have to think of universes as being a certain way. And you have to think about if you thought think of gods, gods have to be a, yeah. a certain way and constrained by this. Yeah, and um, that's well. That's what I I really appreciate about Lewis and uh, and David Armstrong is that they're they people call them world builders and dude exactly what you said. So I studied systematic theology and so it's all about can we coherently make sense of things? Can we make this system work? And so when I came over into philosophy and seeing some world builders, that was always uh, what that's a, a popular critique amongst theologians of analytic philosophy is that uh, you know straining at gnats and and yeah. Uh, focusing so much on a particular thing in language, uh, you know, philosophy of language. But then you do see people building entire universes and worlds here, uh, like right. Lewis and Armstrong. And it, obvious counterexample to uh, the, the claims against analytic uh, philosophy. So I, I love these guys. Yeah, even though yeah. I, I disagree with them, I, I love it. And all the Christian philosophers love them and they respected each other too in the sense that, you know, they – systematic theologians in analytic philosophy get it they got what david yeah. lewis was trying to do right. they may not have agreed with a single tenet <laughs> of it but they got it they understood yeah. like okay all of this goes together your views exactly. about free will go together with your views about block universes which go together with your views about what humans are which go together with possible worlds and you know they so that they understood maybe because they understood it is why they engaged with Lewis so much. Yeah. Why they disagreed right. so strongly with it. But but that, my question for you, Parker, is is it tr is it um is there are there camps also within theology? Like there are people who are systematic and the other people who are like, why are you wasting your time trying to build a coherent world? Is it like that there too? Yeah, it is. Um, and they might be screaming right now. But so we have uh so biblical theology um is a really bad name, really misleading name, but it's the it's a um, it's, it traces themes throughout scripture, throughout the Bible, um, and it, un, it watches them unfold. And so, uh, it would, you know, the, um, like redemption. So you find redemption in Genesis, the re redemption motif of, motif of, uh, God providing a 
covering for Adam and Eve. Um, you know, they try to cover themselves with leaves and it doesn't, it's not going to do it once he kicks them out of the garden. So they, they need to have animal first. So you, you find that and you say, look, there we have God providing a way through the death of an animal. So something has to die to cover sin. So you trace that motif all the way out. And a lot of times biblical theologians will stick to the uh, typologies and they don't go into the systematic and say, hey, well, how does this affect the doctrine of the Trinity? And they go, well, that's right. not in scripture right here. You go, yeah, but we by good and necessary consequences, what yeah. the reformers always say, um, you have to make those connections. And a lot of times they'll resist those connections. Um, so you got the biblical guys, then you got the exegetical guys who are really close to the text. And a lot of times they will just be totally fine with loose ends. Uh, you know, you have this thing that looks like a, an apparent contradiction. Um, Judas, yeah, he fell headlong and died or his stomach burst. But over here it said, he, how do you... They just don't want to connect them. They say, look, the, the Bible doesn't say it, so we're not going to go there. So, yeah, and then the systematicians are usually blamed with just creating these systems that are way too far above Scripture, not connected. And yeah, there's infights, and then depending on the uh, denomination as well. So, okay. so it's we just go, like we go to war. It's just like metaphysics, actually. Yeah. Right? Only yeah, in the totally. metaphysics they're talking about, at least, well, they're talking about presumably things that don't have to connect with theological issues, but some, yeah. but most but often times they do. They right? do, and and bear on top of all the theological debates, we do have the metaphysical debates as well. Yeah. So then we we a theory comes in, b theory comes in, and, and all of that too, because different theologians throughout history have appropriated different the different philosophies of their age. So yeah, we it's wild, man. It's it's a wild time. <laughs> Definitely. Well, so um getting into personhood and um, identity over time, there's these things. I don't know if this was uh, Lewis's word or not, but, but counterparts, I think that's yeah, what Lewis. That's called Lewis's, them, right? so, yeah. Yeah. So trans world identity that, that there is a, there are multiple possible worlds are not just abstract things. They're not just state of states of affairs, but they're concrete worlds like ours. Um, and so there's another, there's multiple Barry lambs in other places, right? Yeah. They're trans can you explain trans world identity to us? Sure. Sure. When if you thought that um that possible worlds were just a useful device for thinking about stuff, but they're not real, they're just stories. Yeah. If you thought that, then there's really no mystery as to uh this question. Like, um imagine a possible world in which uh you were in New York and I was where you, wherever you are. are you, where are you? Um, in Chicago. Yeah. In Chicago. And I was in Chicago. We could easily do that because what a possible world is, is just an imagination or like a story or something. Yeah. And so we could just say, there's no real question of like, is that really you in the possible world? Right. Because, yeah. you know, it's like, it's a story. We just made it up. We can make up whatever we want in a story. Because David Lewis had this view that possible worlds are all real, that is every possibility is real in some possible world, he has to answer this question, right? Yeah. Which is, okay, there's this other being in this other world that looks a lot like me, has my same parents, right? But in that world, some other things are true. It's wearing a red sweatshirt rather than a gray sweatshirt or something, mm -hmm. right? And... Um, so there's this question, what makes that thing you, but not some other thing yeah. in that world? And one of the ways that I tried to motivate this question in the podcast is for people to think about, could you have had a twin, an identical twin? Right. Um, and if you have an identical twin in this world, could you not have had that twin? Right. And a lot of people think, yeah, that's a possibility. If you know the biology of it, it's actually not that unlikely, right. you know, with the zygote, all it had to do was split into two. Yeah, or not. And so yeah. there was just a, a moment where it did or didn't happen. And But if you think that that's a possibility, then you are, really are open to this question if you thought there was these other concrete worlds, which is, um, well, in a world in which my zygote split, which one would be me and which would be my brother? Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Right. And then if you were twins and it didn't split, Right, then you, that's a symmetrical question. Like, yeah, okay, so there's you and your brother here, but like, which one is the one who survives in the world where it didn't split? Right, right. Um, and so David Lewis actually had the better answer than hmm. people who were not realists about possible worlds. If you thought yeah. possible worlds were just made up, then the answer to this question is just make it up. 
<laughs> right? It would just right. be make it up. Just say yeah. like, oh, you're like the first brother, like the one who was born first. Or if they yeah. were taken out, the one on the left. <laughs> you could just make it up, right? And yeah. similarly, you could just make it up for like, if your zygote didn't split, it would be, I don't know, let's let's say it's Penelope and Victoria, right? Then it'd be Penelope. And then Victoria would go, why don't I exist? Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, I just made right. it up. Yep. I'm sorry, I just made it up. I can make up whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but if you're of this like mindset, actually, I don't think you can make it up. I don't think you could just say one way or the other. You just can't, like either way, you could say it's Penelope. No, it's Victoria. They both sound wrong, right? It's just like, yeah. it sounds wrong, mm -hmm. right? Well, you could say it's neither, Yeah. right? Or you could say it's both. Now, both you can't say. Right, because it's contradictory, or because it's contradictory, right? Yeah. Because then, then um, uh, there's this problem of um, what is it called um, transitivity, right? Like, like if 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 it's if it's both, then then they're the same as each other mm -hmm. in this world, right? If right. Penelope is this person and Victoria is that person, then Penelope and Victoria are the same person here. Yeah, but they're not the same person. They're, they're twins. The same, they're, they're brother yeah. and sister. They're, they're sister and sister. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so David Lewis's uh, response is that, oh, it's got to be neither, right? Um, yeah. And so in every possible world, you don't exist. You're here. You're in this world. Mm -hmm. You might call yourself native, right? Yeah. You are a native of this world, and you can only be a native of this world. And you're this big space-time worm that inhabits a segment of time in this world. And in this other world, there's something very similar to you, Yeah. right? And your counterparts are the things that are most similar to you in those worlds, yeah. right? So there are worlds where your parents have um, one child and it's you, and that is your counterpart. There's no other candidates. Mm -hmm. In a world in which there's zygotic splitting and there's twins, you could say, well, they're both counterparts to you in some sense, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like the like one. So I have like maybe two careers. I'm a college professor and I'm a podcast producer. But in the world in which there are twins and one's a podcast producer and the <laughs> other's a college professor, David Lewis would say, well, one resembles you in some respects. Yeah. The other resembles you in some respects. They're both counterparts of you in those respects, and yeah. there's nothing more to say. Right. And I think it's not I think identity. It's so interesting too about because he's systematic. You could go with the 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 space time worm of Barry. Um, it's not just uh, it's not just like the choices that you're making right now, but over time. So one might be way closer to you because of you look at the full history. Look at the four dimensional Barry of this universe and, and Barry two in in you know the closest possible universe. So there there's much more to compare. And so even with the similarity of uh, you know, your twins, one could be way more like you yeah. than the yeah. other. No, yeah. that's right. And there would be more of a counterpart than the other twin. Right. But the, but but counterpart, the relationship between you and your counterpart is not a relationship of identity, right? It's not like right. you are him. And because identity is only you in this world to yourself. Yeah. Right. And so because these other things are concrete, it's like saying that there's somebody who's like there could be somebody who looks a lot like you and is just like you in our world. They live mm. in um, a Bulgaria, but they happen to look a lot like you. And if you learned about this person, you'd be like, whoa, cool. <laughs> I have like kind of like a counterpart in this world. Right. Yeah. And it's the same way. Right. But yeah. if they're not identical to you. Right. right yeah. And yeah. yeah. And and the universe the universe, Barry, uh, you brought this out, but the universes are not the universes of uh, uh, today or in, in our sci-fi where we can travel uh, between them. They're not, you can't, you can't cross universes in, in Lewis's system, right? That's right. To be a universe is to be isolated from another universe. Yeah. The, the, the way, so if you can travel to it, it's the same universe. Yeah. Right. So if, if you can travel to it by time travel or you can travel to it by space, Space travel, it's in the same universe. Yeah. Um, and um, and another th so so in if it turned out that there was like weird quantum loop leaping and all this other yeah. stuff in sci-fi, that would count as the same universe. Right. Right. So then you would have this weird picture of the universe where there are pocket universes within one universe, but in the Lewis sense, it would still be the same universe because there is a way to travel to and from it. 
Yeah. Right. And because you can travel to and from it, you can cause things to happen yeah. between one and the other. If there's some causal connection at, at all in any way, that counts as one Lewisian universe. Yeah. And that's right? that's so interesting to think about. So if there are um if they're you know possible worlds uh is true whatever way you want to take it and i could cross into a different universe and meet another uh, my, my counterpart that's not a counterpart in in a lewisian sense there's still another concrete universe over <laughs> here where that could be happening that's and right. so there's like different types of counterparts and lewis right. says no causal interaction that's right that's right and so like after lewis passes away then you get like second generation metaphysicians who like start making sense of that right yeah so yeah. like second generation metaphysicians start thinking about counterparts you know start thinking about counterparts much closer to home they start saying well what lewis called counterparts is actually me and my future self like they start thinking of the self as counterparts rather yeah. than a worm so they don't think of it like the way that lewis did they oh right rather, yeah 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 um yeah did did Armstrong talk that way? I don't know. I don't, I'm not a big enough Armstrong scholar. Yeah, me neither. I, I need yeah. to get into a more, some, I, I learned about this in class and I, I should have it up, but yeah, I remember um, maybe Alyssa Nay talking about that yeah. in, in her book that, yeah, there's the people have come on and, and added. And so you, you segment. Yeah. It's so interesting. So fascinating. If that's the case though, there, it seems like there's never any you because right. it's not David Lewis, right? There's no me. Yeah. Oh, you are just an instantaneous yeah. thing in existence. And then a second later, it's <laughs> no longer. Right. You know, and that's like, that might be the Buddhist view of the self. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. That might be Derek Parfit's view of the self. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. There, there is a, there are people in metaphysics who go the other way too. They yep. start thinking that in other worlds, they're not counterparts rather they're part of your worm. <laughs> right so like you have so it's no longer a worm it's more like a spider <laughs> yeah it's more like yeah a, right. <laughs> right it's right. more like a it's not even a spider like what would you call it like a neuro neuro a net it's a net yeah, so a yeah. self is a net not a but it's like worm. marching forward in in all these possible worlds that's right together some yeah that's right that's right that's wild yeah, yeah. um I, I wanted to ask about um so i'm not sure if, if lewis believed this or not but there are other, there's these other concrete possible worlds. Is there a, another concrete possible world, world governed by God? Because Lewis, uh, I think you'd call himself an atheist, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's, um, are there other possible worlds where like sci certain sci fi books are true and stuff like that? The official answer is yes. Okay. If those are coherent metaphysical yeah. possibilities, then right. they exist. And I think he would accept that they are. Okay. I mean, it's a coherent metaphysical possibility for the universe to be governed by a single god or mm. a set of gods yeah um, right right whatever all these yeah. stories as long as they're coherent that's right so all the religions could be true depending on which concrete uh, world we're talking about that's right that's yeah. right so I, I thought about this because i think i don't know the relationship between uh lewis and planning i think they might have been friends but i'm not positive on that i don't think lewis had many enemies in the sense okay. that I think I think that he was friendly with just about everybody he corresponded with they disagree You're right and, right and I might disagree about every last thing yeah and you mentioned that in one of the episodes it might have been the last one but the the Christians coming at him um particularly because he was a systematic thinker and he's um because he's re reducing modality to concrete particulars and stuff so yeah. the Christians weren't happy about that and, and back and forth. But I was wondering, so, so planning has this ontological argument, which is like, if God is possible, if he, if he exists possibly in any universe, then this is a necessary being and he exists in every, every universe. And I, I don't know if Lewis had time to think about that, had thought about that, but it seems like if he's allowing a necessarily existent being to exist in one concrete universe, does that not spread to the rest, including our own? Yeah, I mean, I think that if you, um, so I, I don't know everything about Lewis's philosophy of religion, sure. right? but I do know that, um, number one, he believes that with respect to 
monotheism, right? Yeah. So, like, so with, with respect to our universe, the kind of necessary features that are supposed to be present of a god, I don't think he thinks all go together. Go together. Yeah. Right. So there's right? none here. There's no. Yeah. 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 Isn't here for it. Yeah. yeah that's right. Um, so is there an argument for a necessarily existent creature that can be, uh, that can exist in all possible worlds? They have to be consistent with the facts of every possible world. Yeah. If you think about that, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know, like, Lewis's official view about this, but I, my ha I would hazard to guess that there's no single deity, right? No one deity that can possibly be consistent right whose traits are consistent with every possible world i mean look there are yeah. possible worlds that have there has to be a possible world which there's only one thing and that thing is a donkey right like that's got to <laughs> be a possible world right how could you have an existent being like you you'd have to think that that was impossible yeah if you said that there has to be another being a yeah. deity, in addition to the one donkey well, that's, that that's, yeah, that's yeah. when you pull out the uh, incredulous yeah. stare, right? And that yeah. just knocks yeah. it down. And yeah. yeah. Well, so, so I would say that he would think that uh, a being that had to exist in all possible worlds, um, I don't know if that's itself possible. It has to be. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. right. So that, I think that's, that's planning his line. He says, like, if it's, if this being is possible and we let him exist in any, can, any possible world, then he exists in every possible world. So you, what you'd have to do is show that, what some of the attributes are in contradiction to each other or, or it's show not that possible. it's possible. Yeah. Right. So it's either, it's not yeah, yeah, either not possible or necessarily and here. Yeah. So yeah. 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 That's interesting. Um, Lewis in uh, counterfactuals here, he gives us this famous example. I believe you brought it up in the podcast that if kangaroos had no tails, they topple over. Yeah. Um, is there a, there's a concrete possible world where kangaroos are just toppling over for Lewis? Um, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that poor yeah. kangaroos, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Them. Absolutely. Um, and that's a nearby world because that's a counterfactual that has to be true. Yeah. In nearby in every nearby world in which kangaroos didn't have tails that topple over. So that's gotta be a world that's similar enough to our world, but yeah. for the change that kangaroos didn't have their any didn't have tails. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that's <laughs> wild. Um what do, what do you make of that? Are, 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 do you consider yourself a, a, a concretist concerning no, the possible world? No, I don't, you know, I don't have any views. I'm not a metaphysician, mm -hmm. so I don't have any views about um, uh, modal realism versus um, versus this alternative, which is that possible. So, like, uh, there are alternatives, like, possible worlds are just useful fictions, but they're still yeah. things. They're right. just, like useful fictions but, you know there are other thing people that want to be, eliminate all this stuff altogether yeah right and they say like there's no such thing there's not even a thing it's not even a useful fiction right yeah and all of those people were at princeton like there were people at princeton who thought this way wow. about every single way i don't i you know i don't know the, the 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 arguments rest on system building yeah right is it true that the best system that you build requires you to admit of all of these other concrete possible worlds, or can you make do without them? Yeah. And I am just not, I'm not the person who wants to pursue every last detail of that system to figure yeah. out what I think about this. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I'm the, I'm the wrong person to ask <laughs> here, you know, locally, if you think about, particular problems yeah then particular systems get some right versus the other like david lewis gets the twin thing better yeah right the twin thing is better than the because it just seems wrong to me that you could just make up the answer to a question like or that. or that is, there's just a, a empty hole where that answer is supposed to be right where that's, it's just like no right. there's not there's no answer to it it's like well what that doesn't sound right to us either yeah that's right but then there are other things um that um that you know the 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 actualist or the, the opponents to modal realism um, get get right also right yeah. so I think it's well accepted now that you can have a theory of counterfactuals um, without having modal realism at all yeah right so like you don't need to it's added on to that and so like if you're a big fan of Occam's Razor there then you think okay we don't need modal realism to get to yeah. make sense of all of that stuff yeah um, 
but you know, I it's not it's not something that I have done extensive, right. you know, analysis of. Yeah. Well, um, Barry. So, so there's all these concrete worlds. Um, how how do we define or how do we make sense of ours? Because they're all equally uh, real on on this mortal realism. Is it just that I am here? Is it is that like the indexical that attached to me that makes it mine? That's Lewis's view. Yeah. Right. That's Lewis's view. So you're com you're the only thing that's special about your possible world is that it's the one you're in yeah um you might you might extend that to um explaining why you have particular moral concern with mm. your possible world um and the people in your your own possible world um some you know some people have taken yeah taken issue with that like is it really true that we uh if lewis is right that our moral concern should only be with things within our own possible worlds like how could other things not have as much step you know um how could yeah, other like, beings in other possible worlds not have the same kind of status yeah right like, if, they, if they're like us they should have the same moral status yeah but then um, but they're we're causally disconnected so it's like well you know you shouldn't be probably protesting for equal rights across uh trans world identity because it you can't affect them anyways yeah yeah no, that's right. I, you know, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't, um, there are people who, since, since Lewis has passed, including some colleagues of his, who are trying to draw out some of the moral implications yeah. uh, of, of the view. And, and, you know, more recent, so something I do know a little bit more about that has nothing to do with possible worlds, but about the space-time worm thing of the self. Yeah, yeah. Right. So there have been plenty of discussion about whether, a view like that really means that every stage of yourself should have equal moral concern and moral status mm. and not only later stages of yourself, right? So if you were only one person, yeah, then it would make sense for you to right now sacrifice some of your current pleasures for, you know, your older self. Like yeah. you might, saving for retirement is like a great example of this, but also like, you know, like studying something that's really hard now so that your future self can reap the benefits of it or exercising right, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah or exercising yeah. or like foregoing dieting right like foregoing yeah. some pleasures now um because if you really were instantaneous selves <laughs> and like later selves are just instantaneous selves in them then you really are letting your future self dictate and sacrifice your current pleasures in a way yeah. that you're talking the same thing would be true of a third party, right? It's like yeah. you are no more the same as a future self than you are with somebody else. Yeah. Right. And so like, maybe you are pretty selfless and that you're willing to, you know, diet now. So somebody else could lose weight, but, yeah. Yeah. but, but, but so people have started, you know, react, you know, responding to this, like it has to be, they say, um, false that we're these, space-time worms that every yeah. inning every inning is just this unique entity right? yeah that's so fascinating because it would be like all of us it's our retirement self is just yeah. feeding off of our younger selves and that's right. stealing stuff so that this dude can go in his yacht um, from all the money we're going to make on uh, philosophy podcasts <laughs> <laughs> that's right, right. <laughs> oh yeah that kind of thing absolutely right. absolutely anytime you think of yourself as making a sacrifice for your future self's sake if it really were as distinct as some other person, there's a kind of um, uh, there's a kind of uh, imposed um, tyranny yeah. of the future self on the yeah. present self. If, if you like. and and the way that we talk about it in ordinary life is that actually, you, in order to be prudent, in order to be rational, you have to be forward looking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, in in like that's so that's really interesting, and I wonder. Now, like, it seems to me that phenomenology is coming back around, and I wonder if there's like a, you know, a phenomenological case where you say, well, look, you you do think of yourself as multiple people because at night, you say, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Morning Parker worry about waking up, but I'm staying up to listen to more of Barry's podcast. Yeah. You know, like screw screw my future self, or we do care for our future selves. Uh, I think about have you seen the movie Looper? 
Yep, absolutely. So it's it's like the same kind of thing where it's absolutely yeah. yeah. They're, they're spoilers if you haven't seen it yet, everyone. <laughs> but he's fighting with himself, um, and he makes different decisions against himself of of his future. It's yeah, yeah it's really fascinating. The, the whole premise of that movie is that a bunch of hitmen are killing their future selves yeah. and celebrating that right. they will die by their own hand, and yeah. that's called closing the loop. <laughs> yeah, and they get they get all this gold, uh, yeah. and they get to retire for thirty years until someone sends them back to then get killed. To get killed by that by by their, their by their past selves. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, and you know, how much of this is a problem? Well, it's definitely a problem if you think like Lewis that we're these space time worms. Yeah, but, right. It's definitely a problem if you think that. Um, uh, but the the fact that you know if you probably go and tell. Joe Schmo, your friend, about this, and they're just going to think it's a silly philosophical <laughs> right. Right. paradox, right? They're yeah. just going to say, okay, that's silly, yeah. right? Like the reason why I'm dieting is because I'm going to be the one who's yeah. going to be enjoying the the fruits of, you know, dieting. Um, so, 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 you know, that kind of consideration. Now, I don't know how much that translates into the modal realism case but it's one of those things which, which metaphysics is intersecting with yeah you know, well i think philosophy. back to you, i think back to your dissertation as well rationality over time you need to be you need personal identity over time in order for that to to be the case right so you you whatever the case uh you have to make sense whatever our metaphysics of time is you have to be able to still have personal identity over time and some people argue against atheists, atheists on that and say, well, you're just wholly present at this. In what I sense am I, me, in the next sense, especially if we bring in all these tense things, like it's, I'm completely different than the next moment. No, maybe not completely, but I'm dissimilar in that yeah. I even inhabit a different moment that he, that he could never inhabit ever. No, that's right. Yeah. 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 This is wild <laughs> stuff. This is wild yeah. stuff. Well, uh, Barry, I wanted to, to finish up by asking about um public philosophy um, oh yeah sure you, you, you have a you have a philosophy podcast um and i don't mean to put you on the spot or anything but how how much of your podcast is like um thought through you're trying to influence culture and uh, uh bring philosophy to the public and and how much of it was like hey i'm i'm i like philosophy and i want to talk about it on a podcast is there is there a relation there or one no, or the it's, other? It's the first. It's the first Okay. Thing. I mean, I, I spend two to three months per episode and of the Lewis series a lot longer than that. I spent yeah. years gathering. You don't do that just because you think it's kind of fun and you just want to talk <laughs> about it. In fact, you know, what, when you realize as you're doing something that you're hating the moment where you're doing it, that's when you know like you're you're all in on something and it's a yeah. bigger, it's a bigger thing yeah. than like just something that's fun. You know, because my show is more of a documentary than it is just like sitting around chatting about stuff. Right. It's um, it requires me to think a lot at even line by line when mm -hmm. I what I'm going to say about something. I spent. Let me give you an example. So that second episode of the Lewis series was about Lewis on conversations, right? Yeah. Which is like just this like small little, but it can be pretty pedantic. But he had this paper, and I've taught this paper many times it's called scorekeeping in a language game which likens conversations to baseball which mm -hmm. is funny i use the baseball analogy today i spent maybe five hours trying to figure out how to explain that paper in four minutes yeah <laughs> right and I, you would only do that if you thought okay this is what i think people out there who know nothing about philosophy nothing about david lewis and don't care about this need to know yeah <laughs> right yeah. and um and so so my aim really is to especially in this country make this field make this way of thinking make people in this area uh as pr as prominent in people's thinking about life as say economics is yeah. or as uh, psychology is or as political science is or as big data is because really in this country you can't you can't you can't have an issue or you can't have a public conversation without somebody saying economists think blah 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 or like right there which tells me 
that Americans are looking, the media and people are looking to particular ways of thinking and particular kinds of researchers yeah. to answer their questions. Yeah. Right. And I'm not saying philosophy is better than that. I really don't think that. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think it's significantly worse. Like it's just like so, because we know in other countries that they go to people who are philosophers that have thought along about things like in France, in Britain, in yeah. Australia, in like mainland Europe, even in Mexico. Yeah. Like there's, there's this idea that, okay, um, economists say something about this and like doctors will say something about this and psychologists have something to say about it, but nobody looks to philosophers. Cause in this country, it's like, Oh, those are just like the kooky people and you take right. a class in college and right. I've, I've thought about that a lot. Um, and I wonder, it's, I wonder if it's our American spirit because our great philosophy is pragmatism. Uh, and maybe, maybe there's more, right. But we're, we're pragmatic people, uh, by and large, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a cowboy rooting, shooting, you know, ask, ask questions after, um, and I, I wonder it, it's, it's confused me, but you make such a good point. Even thinking about England or France, France is a really good example too, but, um, I, I love, I love that sometimes things make it out of a philosophy, like, like, uh, the cogito is in like yeah, people, yeah. everyone knows that one. Um, yeah. and paradigm shift, what, you know, philosophy yeah. of science from Kuhn, but so every now and then they make it out. And so I'm, I'm glad that you are, are doing that. I think usually they make it out in, in sci-fi. Have you, have you thought about that, that relationship? Yeah, between yeah, no, definitely. It makes a lot, it makes it out a lot in sci-fi. It doesn't make yeah. it out a lot in, um, in everyday discourse, like, yeah. you know, current events discourse or, or things like that. Sci-fi is great in that respect. And so that's what we have that's great here. It's in this country, we have a very strong sci-fi tradition, yeah. which which deals with a lot of the metaphysical issues. And that's why Lewis is relevant there, you know? Yes, A lot time. of his issues are, are, are related to science fiction. Yeah. Um, but it's not, I don't know what the answer to your question is. Is it is it because Americans are a certain way that the media doesn't, present philosophy as being insightful about stuff or is the media a certain way yeah. right and i don't know what the answer to that is i i will know yeah. i will just egg. yeah and yeah. and they're made the media is made up of americans as well right so it's like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like look i don't think everybody is interested in it but <laughs> i don't think everybody's interested in economics either you always right. have an economist say something about something <laughs> yeah yeah right? that's a great point that's a great point yeah. man okay um yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, who who's the who's the audience for a mini series like um, the Man of Many Worlds? Like, have do you know if you've gotten people who are not uh, philosophers to listen as well and enjoyed it? I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are plenty. There hasn't been nearly as many as say when I did the series on philosophy and criminal justice. Yeah, you know, it may yeah. be half of that. Yeah. You know, right. but but there's got to be more than philosophers because there aren't that many philosophers. So and like you know, just, you look at download <laughs> numbers. It's not, it can't be just philosophers because there's right. not that many. But even given that, my I'm hoping the audience will be everybody. Like right, like right. you know, like I, I was you know also around the time that David Lewis died, there was um there was the movie A Beautiful Mind based on mm -hmm. the book, and that was John Nash, right? And yeah, I kind of modeled my series on that. You know, like bio biography with a little bit more intellectual stuff because, yeah. you know, there was the biography of John Nash, but like, you know, John Nash worked in game theory. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it's not like that's in intrinsically interesting to the American public <laughs> about anything. Right. Right. So, but it was intellectual biography and, you know, that was a best picture. And, and, um, and I thought, look, if there's an audience for that, you know, I could make something on David Lewis, but it just turns out that, um, that, wow. Like I'm hoping that it'll, go out to more people because it's yeah. not meant for just philosophers. Right. Right. And, um, I instantly thought of, uh, Alan Turing and the yeah. imitation game and right. it's imitation just game is another great beautifully example. done, like perfectly, like it matches his paper, even the way that he's being interrogated by the police and to see if he's a real person or whatever. It, fantastic. Yeah. I think, um, that's something we talk about in, in theology a ton is, is, uh, narratives. And, uh, because it, it comes up in, in the Bible all the time that this is, this is our meta narrative. Right. And so, uh, so sociologists talk about narratives and how important they are to humans, how we've made sense of the world through narrative. So I think by you doing, uh, a narrative, uh, philosophy podcast, I think that's, that's huge. It, it sucks you in. I remember being like, I wish that 
it was next week already. So I could listen to the next <laughs> installment. So yeah. um, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I really like it. I I've wrestled with this myself of, of, cause I want to do, I want to bring philosophy to the world. I want to bring theology to the world, the stuff that I'm learning. Let's just learn it out loud with other people. Yeah. And sometimes I've, I've tried to hook people in with like, can Siri be your, your um, best friend? And then now I'm, I'm sneaking in some Chinese room stuff, some Chinese yeah. nation stuff, talking about AI and strong AI and stuff. And it, it works fairly well, but you know, in the podcast game, it's like, who's your intended audience? And I yeah. think, well, it's probably master's students in theology and philosophy. <laughs> and I'm right. not going to, so I'm not going to get this broader reach. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be continuing to look to you to see you broaden that scope, man. And I'll yeah, just ride your so. coattails. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I hope so. That's the mission anyways. That's the goal. Yeah. So, um, slates, slates, a, a broader entity. How did yeah. you get hooked up with them to, to pitch this philosophy podcast to them? So when I started on the first season, one of the things that put me on the map is um, Slate has a culture show. Their Slate Culture Gap, they, they review movies, Netflix series, yeah. books, and they review podcasts. And somehow somebody pitched my podcast for them to review. Mm. And I don't know how that happened, but they reviewed it and they reviewed it very positively which yeah. was really hard because I was like one person doing the show. I'm still one person doing the show, but they liked it more than they liked, you know, radio lab or whatever, like these yeah. huge shows. And so because that happened, I made a second season and then I just went to slate and I said, I, 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 I pitched them the show to put on their network. And, um, the, the person who was in charge of podcasts at that time, um, just said, great. You know, yeah. and um, and so I still own the show. I still uh, produce it independently, but Slate puts their brand on it. Slate helps to promote it, and Slate helps um, try you know try to sell ads for it when they can. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not it's not a it's not a high priority show at Slate because Slate yeah. does in house production, right. and because they spend an enormous amount of money on those shows, they need to make that money back and then some. Right. Whereas my show is just this show that is an independent show that that they bring into the network just for cross promotion's sake. Yeah. So. Well, that's fantastic to hear that you still have that. Uh, you still have the intellectual freedom, and you still have you know it's still your baby. You didn't you didn't give the reins over to anyone else. I, yeah, I love that. Abs absolutely. With, with that in mind, um, don't give any secrets or anything away. But are, is there any? Um, plans to do another uh series like the one you did with with lewis on a different philosopher there aren't any plans okay. i would I a lot of th the way things happen at hi-fi nation is not really planned things are just happened you know yeah. organically yeah, definitely um so like for for lewis it was because i happened to be in australia mm. and everybody in australia loves david lewis and knew right. david lewis so i was yeah. just like you know let's just talk to everybody and of course i went to princeton so they had a lot of colleagues here but surprisingly, the colleagues had less to say than the people in Australia did. Wow! Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Um, um, I would, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to do it. It's just here's the, here's another thing too with biogra biographical facts. A lot of people are very protective of their reputations, mm. right? And Lewis didn't have any skeletons in the closet, you know. Yeah. But what makes for good radio? You kind of need that kind of stuff. Yeah, you need and the a lot spicy of people aren't stuff. Open, aren't going to open up, but like I would love to do it, you know, preferably on someone living too. Yeah, um, that, that that would be the hard one. The, the if someone's already passed away, then it's easier to dig up stuff and you yeah. know put it all in context. I think I think um, I think David Edmonds of Philosophy Bites is doing a series on Parfit. Are you trying to do a series? Oh, on okay, Parfit, cool. I'll have to check Parfit. that out. But I don't I don't know how, what the status of that is. Um, I'd like to do more series. I think I think the. The criminal justice series was a was a big success and i'd yeah. like to do more it's just what would it be you know everybody wants to do series on philosophy and ai and computing uh, and stuff that's right that's at the right. moment yeah. i'm kind of excited about the one thing i was thinking about the other day was um um the seven deadly sins and the seven cardinal virtues mm. i think that that might be an interesting series yeah um, I really like that movie Seven, which came out like a long time ago. Yeah, that's a, that's a while. Um, but I, that, I, that's like fourteen episodes. That's not like. <laughs> yeah, seven. you just call it "What's in the Box," and it's yeah. uh, <laughs> that's that's really gruesome. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that would be great. Definitely. Um. 
uh, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, um, he, he goes over uh, the virtues as well. He's got his own kind of um, uh, theology, philosophy of them. That would, that would be really fascinating. Um, man, I'm excited. I'm excited for, for what's happening, uh, what, what, what could happen at, at, at uh, Hi-Fi Nation. Uh, Barry, thanks so much for, for coming on and sharing your time, sharing all your, your influence, um, sharing all your uh, expertise. I uh, really seriously appreciate it. And uh, man, I'd, I know this is way in your past, but the, the rationality stuff is really fascinating to me. I'm, I, I love that. Maybe, um, maybe we'll have to talk about that sometime. That'd be fun. Yeah, thanks, Parker. Yeah. Um, so uh, once again, let me just, where can people find your stuff? Do you, do you have a, a blog or website as well? Yeah, HiFiNation.org, H-I-P-H-I Nation.org. You get a link to every episode there. In fact, there's a player there. You can scroll through that, go to get every episode. And every episode's got, you know, from season one through five, it's got a description and even the transcripts are up. So, yeah, I saw that. That's, that's wild, man. That's a lot of work. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't my listeners don't look forward to that from me. I'm not going to be doing all of that work that Barry does. Um, but uh, that's going to have to do it, folks. This has been Parker's Pensies. Hopefully we can continue this conversation or have a new one with Barry. Um, for now, that's it. Thanks for listening. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God.